Right, hello. Uh, it's uh, Russell Tovey here. I play Henry in this episode of Sherlock, and I'm very happy to be doing the uh, commentary today with... I'm Stephen Moffat. I'm co-creator of Sherlock. Uh, I'm Mark Gators, co-creator of Sherlock and writer of this episode. And I am Sue Virtue, and I'm producer this episode. So this little boy is a little version of me. Yes. And the story that I've got about this is that <laughs> when I got the part, um, they rung up and said that they needed a younger version of me, and my nephew has got sticky out ears like me, which is <laughs> quite... What? Yeah. Yes. Really? <laughs> yeah. But he came in and he actually auditioned and he was great, but I think he's too young. Mm. And actually seeing what they, this little boy has to kind of go through running <laughs> around, he would have been too young. Was very he is a boy. mini you, though. He really it's is, isn't sweet. he? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, don't, so I can't remember the process of finding the, the other mini you, but he does have yeah. a look at you, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Different accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very different. <laughs> <laughs> How did you come up with the um, the title sequence? The uh, Obviously, Shots of London is quite obvious, but the music is... Well, this is not uh, This uh, is the old one now, actually. Oh, oh, is there going to be a new one? Yeah, well, there is a new there one. Is a new one yeah. well, well, what we are looking at what in this commentary is the old one. one, but what you are looking at, <laughs> there's not only enough, as we discussed the old title <laughs> sequence, <laughs> is, is the, the new title ah. sequence. I hope this commentary is informing you. <laughs> it's the same but different. Same yes. music? <laughs> yes, yes. Same yes. music, yes. yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, I know David Arnold, uh, and it came about after we did the pilot, and when we were doing the pilot, actually, um, you know, of getting... Why don't we get the manager James Bond to do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, wow. it's worked out rather well. Now, uh, this scene, uh, the writing of this scene, uh, I happen to know was a bit of a bugger. We discussed it a lot. <laughs> and I remember you phoning up, because uh, it, it just didn't feel as it was energised. I remember you phoning up so excited. You said, I'm going to use the beginning of Black Peter. Yeah. Is well, that what this is from? Does yeah. he harp in something? Yeah, in? This is, ah. there's a story which uh, hasn't been much... Um, celebrated. I think I've probably done once before. Um, called Black Peter. It's not a, not a very interesting uh, story, but it has this fantastic opening where um, Sherlock Holmes just comes back to Baker Street uh, with a harpoon covered in blood, and he's been sticking it in pigs all morning. And it's actually because uh, uh, an elderly sea captain, Captain Peter Carey, has been found speared to the cabin of his, the wall of his cabin. Um, and I just, well, that's just fantastic. Why don't we just have that? It, need, it needed something to, to start mm. it. To puncture it. Um, the many... shot of him at the door, though, we shot about <laughs> yes. two months later than Absolutely. the rest of the scene. Didn't oh, it really? was hanging around. It was one of those, yeah. like a snag list scene. <laughs> it was just never going to happen. Uh, it was it was always uh, hang, falling off day, the end of, uh, of, of call sheets. How many stories are there, Sherlock stories? 60. 56 short stories and four novels. Yeah. Mm. And you've based... Most of your Sherlock episodes on the novels, or have they been adapted? Well, from it, it varies from that different. One. I, um, this is obviously based pretty straightforwardly on Home of the Baskervilles. Yeah. Um, but actually, Mark's previous one, The Great Game, was based on how many stories? Um, uh, well, five Orange Pips. Five Orange Pips. Um, Bruce Partington plans. There's bits of the final problem. I mean, yeah. So uh, we're quite eclectic. We don't. I mean, we, we obviously take considerable liberties because we are updating them. Um, mm. Uh, so we, we just take the attitude that you, you, you can magpie around. Most of the stories are probably got a, got about 20 minutes of screen time in them. So you have to add them together or elaborate them. And it's just choosing the really cool bits. And, mm. sort of and again, because because the Basil Rathbone, Nigel Bruce films were a great influence and inspiration, that's exactly what they did. They just said, well, well, we'll take that bit and, oh, that's good. And that's what sort of makes them... Hum, they're, they're so exciting uh, because Doyle himself, uh, you know, often did brilliant beginnings and then incredibly perfunctory endings, right. mostly because he just had somewhere else to go. <laughs> so there are a lot of shipwrecks and, and, and things like, we were never destined to find out what happened. <laughs> because someone came to my door and offered me a game of cricket. <laughs> go after her and apologize. Apologize? Mm -hmm. Oh, John, I envy you so much. You envy me. Your mind is so placid, straight. And have you read read all the books? Yes. Oh God, cool. are we are. Have you really, really, really? Oh yeah. God, yes. I mean, Mark and I are uh, <laughs> uh, absolute fanboys of Sherlock Holmes. We adore I was Sherlock Holmes. The ridiculous Holmes. thing. I I read the Adventures first, and then I got the complete Sherlock Holmes. What age was this? Oh, eight or nine. And and oh, I God. I read them all, 
because I wanted to be able to say I had read all Sherlock Holmes. As Stephen pointed out, only an idiot geek would think that would somehow make people... <laughs> <laughs> that would get you laid. In the place. Right? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't have a date for 32 years. <laughs> oh, but Sorry, but you have read... Oh, that, that makes all the difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, no, I mean, we, uh, they're pretty much all out of copyright. Well, they're all out of copyright yeah. here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. about... Because the strange thing is, he actually Doyle carried on writing. He killed off Sherlock Holmes, then brought him back ten years later, and then he carried on intermittently until 1929. The last one was published, so the, the whole thing lasts a lot longer, really. And indeed, you know, he starts writing them as a young man and ends, you know, in the last few years of his life, still writing them. Mm. Did he write anything else apart from Sherlock Holmes? Oh, loads, yeah. loads, and this was he sort of he sort of at least claimed to really despise Sherlock Holmes as being his sort of cheap output. Whereas he had lots of uh, lots of historical novels and uh, the Professor Challenger novels, the Brigadier Gerard stories, all sorts of lots of stuff. That's really have really you read good. them ones? Not not all of them, but I've read a fair a fair number. Yeah. He's a wonderful writer, oh. and he's right. This did eclipse everything else. But the thing is, it's he, it is the single biggest hit in fiction. There's no question. There's no second place. Is there? What's rather wonderful about it though is that you know, like all great ideas, he never really got it he never understood what he created the rest of the world got it yeah he was famously dismissive of him but mm. but um ultimately i think kind of um got a sort of peace with sherlock holmes mm. but but the stuff he really wanted to survive Can i just say that our really impress- impression is by our son <laughs> yes that's true yes was it? Uh, colored yes. by me mm. <laughs> colored by Sue virtue not, not the one you actually saw there because <laughs> <laughs> we want to get it yeah yeah <laughs> sorry sorry confusing. audience this must be so confusing I'll let's just explain let's again we are watching an older version. You are watching the pristine new one. So. Um, the Hound of the Baskervilles is the most famous Sherlock Holmes story, principally because having killed off Sherlock Holmes in The Final Problem, the nation went into mourning. Uh, f- famously, young men of fashion started wearing black crepe in their hats, and, and Doyle was vilified for it. Mm. And, um, and a few years later, uh, he had an idea in collaboration with a journalist friend called Fletcher Robinson to do a, a ghost story about a, a, a monstrous hound because he'd heard certain legends about the hound of Dartmoor. And he decided to present it as a Sherlock Holmes story mm-hmm. to give it its best chance of succeeding, mm-hmm. but setting it as a, a prequel before he died. And that's the reason. The reason it's mo- the most famous is that it, it was a publishing phenomenon. It was people were so desperate for more Sherlock Holmes. This story became the thing. Do you and think it if he'd have done that before he'd killed off Sherlock, if this had been released, would it have been as successful? Well, it's a great story. Yeah, uh, it is an intractable story, as we discovered yes. trying try to do it. But it is. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Um, do you think it's to do with timing, though? But, but it's, became... the, it's very much the timing. I think right. that's, and it is the most filmed uh, of them all. Probably one of the most filmed stories of all time. Yeah, it, 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 only Dracula surely could compete. And probably, yeah. I yeah. mean, just in terms of the number, the number of movie versions that have been of this, I'd be but, frightened to work out what number this is. Yes. <laughs> So what, I, what I really wanted to do, though, um, because it, you know Doyle, he wrote to his mother and said, "I'm going to make it a real creeper," mm. and it is a it's a lovely spook story, you know. Mm. To, uh, but but almost every version uh, tends to to stumble over the fact that it, that it had, of course it has a rational explanation, as ultimately this does. But I wanted to uh, make sure it was as horrifying as possible to really go mm. for the the scares. You know. Do you feel a huge pressure because it's one of the ones that's been done? Yeah. <laughs> Christ, yes. The, the yeah. pressure was smoking out of him at times. I have to say that. I, tell you, I mean, there are, it's worth saying that because it's so well known, um, if, if it was a version of The Sign of Four, mm. you just wouldn't feel the pressure, pressure. to, not just the not just pressure of its fame, but the pressure mm. to include certain things. People have seen so many versions. Yes. I think they know certain beats of the story. Mm-hmm. It feels wrong not to do. So, um, you know, the, initially, uh, I remember in the early drafts, it was Dr. Mortimer who comes, uh, mm-hmm. as, as he does in the original. Um, and I remember Stephen saying, actually, I think we need, we need a Sir Henry figure, hence Henry Knight, but it's not, uh, it's not the same relationship as it is in the book. Mm-hmm. But there are lots of little beats, the Grimpen, Mi- the Grimpen Meyer becomes the Grimpen Minefield, things like that, because I think people... Uh, right. People know them in, in just in the back of their heads. They know that there should be yeah. something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. So how do you feel about this scene, watching this now? 
Was this I, a success for you? From you said it was a struggle to. It was a struggle, I think, uh, because it was the first time because uh, you started writing first this year, Mark. Yes, yeah. you did indeed last year. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, interesting. <laughs> and mine's always the last day's production. What, <laughs> what does this say you. about <laughs> me? Um, but you know, it's the first time we've done a client scene. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the staple of Sherlock Holmes: the, the, the books and the stories. A client will come to Baker Street and express their problems, and Sherlock Holmes will make some alarmingly clever deductions. Mm -hmm. And it was just it was just tricky, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, just to make it to come to life, he's got to sit there and tell a story, and then uh, and that's in itself a slightly boring thing to do. Yeah. Uh, then came up with the idea of the uh, interview. Uh, the interview and the thing. And yeah, the, because it was about, it's again it's about the modern equivalents. Now, mm -hmm. now in the original, Doctor Mortimer comes and he says, "I've got this legend to tell you," and and in most adaptations, that's how it usually starts with Sir Hugo Baskerville, and, and you get a lovely, vivid restoration thing of wenches being yeah. sacrificed to the moor and I thought, well we're, we're not going to do that so you get an equivalence again which is actually to tell the bulk of his story by means of a sort of you know living tv documentary mm -hmm. uh and and I, I, I those are the sort of things that i think become quite exciting because mm. you think yeah. right we've got it this is this is our version of, of mm. that legend mm -hmm. is to have a tv reporter saying is there something terrible out there mm -hmm. yeah yeah I'm that isn't a real cigarette. That's that honey rose things because it's illegal to smoke on set, isn't it? Yep. Yes, it is. We were just saying that's that. the illusion collapsing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how is this scene for you, Russell? Well, yeah, I quite liked it. I was quite pleased. Yeah, I really enjoyed doing it on the day. It felt like. Did you feel? I mean, talking about uh, not pressure, but it was in that way. It's a bit like I suppose stepping on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. If you actually sit in the the client's chair in Baker Street. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a bit. I mean, but the writing was so good, obviously, yeah. and uh, the Benedict yeah. and Martin are amazing mm. in the direction and the production, and the, yeah. the producers are just phenomenal. <laughs> you may come again. <laughs> <laughs> you may never that, leave. That helped. <laughs> Another wine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this um, uh, deduction, I remember uh, coming up with, because obviously... And we, we, this idea arrived mm. on a train, and we we spend a lot of time on trains, <laughs> mostly to Cardiff and back. But I remember, um, I remember uh, the person opposite me knocking their coffee over and mopping it up, and that was what gave me the idea about the phone number, mm -hmm. and then the going over it again, which would then mean that he initially cared about it, and then blowing his nose, changed his mind, etc. It was a good train journey. Yeah. They, they often are. All the good things happen on train journeys. I love the set. Coming onto the set was just mm. wonderful. It does feel like home, doesn't it's it? so home, great. Yeah. So well designed. and There's things in there I wanted to take home. <laughs> I like the rug. That's, That's where they you? went. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry. <laughs> feel me. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, somehow we've always feel that the show is that it's more Sherlocky when we're in the set. Yeah, it yeah, feels yeah. Our heartland. We've just gone past the, uh, one the of the great line. famous line, which is uh, Mr. Holmes to the footprints of a gigantic hand, which we've slightly redeployed. We've made it the, the reason that Sherlock takes the case. Yes. Because of the odd expression. Because it's a thing that Mark pointed out. <coughs> you'd never say hound now. A young yes. man wouldn't say hound. He'd say dog. dog. Or, yeah. Yeah, so it was... Um, it was but, great. It was a but great. You redeployed it as yeah. a critical clue. It, it became a thing. It was like, well, well, what if, wait, what if it's archaic? Maybe that's maybe that's what it's all about. Actually, mm. and it's also this. The other famous thing about the original story, because Doyle, although he brought him back, was sick of him. Mm. <laughs> that Sherlock Holmes disappears for the bulk of the story. He sends Doctor Watson down, mm. and although he does actually go himself in secret. Most of it is told by by Doctor Watson. So it, it was a, it was a thing of um, of having the fun of of going through the process of saying no I can't possibly go and then saying I wouldn't miss this for the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully if you know the story, if Sherlock Holmes fan, it's like oh they're not gonna oh are they gonna not do it mm. not, and then suddenly you get all the. I fun love as Russell's well. tone of amusement all through that about what <laughs> was going on. Yeah. <laughs> that was just Russell. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so this is actually Baker Street, isn't it? Uh, it's up a Gow North Gower Street. Gower Street. Mm. Okay. It's not far It's in the vicinity away. of yeah. that. It's London. And it's, it is London. <laughs> it's similar to Baker Street, but Baker mm -hmm. Street was just not practical for it. We, we, we were quite keen at one point. We were trying to actually be the first Sherlock Holmes thing ever to shoot on real Baker Street. Thank but God. But didn't we find out the other day that, in fact, they did 
film on North Gower Street before. The movie? Oh, I nearly did. No, years and years ago. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's I'll know who we're directing. Oh, really? Well, I'll ask Alan Barnes. He knows <laughs> everything. <laughs> How do you feel about the movie being around and you guys being around? And Well, it's, a, it's, it's an odd one, isn't it? Especially as we end up releasing it roughly at the same time. But I don't think we have... I don't know if we do anything good to each other. We certainly don't do anything bad to each other. Mm. And it's such different takes on it. They're doing a very sort of uh, action movie version in Victorian times. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a probably actually slightly more authentic version, but we're actually modernizing it. Yeah, modernizing yeah, yeah. it. So we're, we're working such different sides of the street. I don't think it's an issue because nobody can ever be the definitive version anyway. There are so many versions of mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of has right. their favorite. I, yeah. I do remember we had the conversation early on because we were... We were making we were making the pilot when the film was announced, and it was one of those moments of like, oh god, this, this always happens. Yeah, yeah. There's always two Robin Hood films at the yeah, same yeah, time. Yeah. As well. It's so strange, nothing for years. But actually, in the end, the thing that was great, of course, is that it was a massive hit. If if the film had sunk with that trace, it might have sort of tainted the notion. Yeah, yeah, in fact, yeah. all people want is more Sherlock, which is brilliant. Do you right? get asked that a lot then? Do people try and make comparisons. No, not really. I mean, they always try to make some sort of feud. Uh, nor, nor should they because yeah. you can totally enjoy, why not I mean yeah. you know you can go see a film in the afternoon and watch this in the evening you know 24 hours in a day and in <laughs> <laughs> but also you can then watch Jeremy Brett is still being yeah. transmitted and yeah. Basil Rathbone films are still on television it's not like I mean you can yeah. do something else with your day yeah. but that's just a, that's an Mark and day. I don't do anything <laughs> else in our day this is what we do yeah. <laughs> now this is a, what was this village called Saint Saint it was Saint it's very lovely. Should we mention our resequencing here? Yes, indeed. This uh, originally, I had a big, we had a big argument yeah. about this recently. <laughs> With um, who? Well, principally between me, <laughs> me. and Sue. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah, the husband uh, and wife. <laughs> yeah, the husband and wife team. Were, uh, I didn't like this idea initially. I like it now. So originally, we went straight to the army base and went straight downstairs and saw all the, the, the cool stuff there, and then we went to the village. And Sue said, "Well, no, that's wrong. We should go to the village first and then hold the army base and." Uh, well, it, it came about because I, when I was writing, I was in Cornwall having a real struggle with it. it, and it is, we'll talk about this further. But how long did it take to write it? 2,000 years. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it's an and that was the first day. It's an intractable story because ultimately it's always disappointing because at the end it's just a dog with luminous paint on, no matter what you do. Yeah. Uh, I was absolutely determined, we were absolutely determined that it wouldn't be this time. Mm -hmm. Solving that issue... It nearly killed me because <laughs> right. if it's not that what is it because it can't be a ghost it can't be a monster so what yeah. is it anyway that's another story we'll go on to that but one of the things I had a bit of a breakthrough when I was in Cornwall was was to was to sort of kick the existing half a draft mm. up the arse by as soon as they leave Baker Street they just go right boom and they're there. It's like cut out all the shoe leather. Yeah. Mm. And originally, I wrote a thing like a sort of Google Earth thing where you just go do 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 Dartmoor, mm. which is like the equivalent of one of those old, like in Indiana Jones where the, the plane is flying. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, let's just go there. He's got a fake ID. They just go there. And that that was the way it was for a long time. Um, but funnily enough, this way around, I think getting to know the area, although it's more traditional. It's funny enough, and you look at the running time, it doesn't make that much difference. No, it they're, doesn't. They're, they're there quite quickly, yeah. but somehow it just gave it, I think, a kind of texture, mm. which, which it didn't have. It also means that the visits to Baskerville are better spaced out. The other way around, you went very early and you didn't go back for ages, which, which somehow I thought didn't work. Right. Mm. But mostly the, the row erupted between... Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's nearly over. <laughs> <laughs> where was it we shot the exteriors, when we, where Dewar's Hollow is and where the rocky, craggy <laughs> bits are? That was... Cribsheet, uh, Cribsheet, Cribsheet. <laughs> <laughs> it was Wales. I know it's it near well. Castle Cough, wasn't it? Mm, yes, yeah. So that again? Pardon? What? <laughs> <laughs> Castle Koch. 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 Nice. Koch. Good pronunciation. Yeah. Yeah. But also the Dartmoor, because we weren't going to get a Dartmoor originally. No. Were we? We were going to sort of try and get oh, a Dartmoor, Dartmoor, wasn't it? That's yeah. it? Yes, it is. We talked Dartmoor, about, yeah. um, actually, you know, because there's so much happens at night on the moor, we just needed more. But, but yeah. Paul And then Paul actually, said, well, let's just pop down to Dartmoor and, and go and see it, because I don't really know what it looks like, and yeah. then we'll get a few plate shots. And we were down there for days, weren't we? Uh, only three, um. <laughs> but it, I mean, it does make a huge difference because the the landscape is so different. It's it's so dramatic. Those tours are just like nowhere else. Yeah. Mm. Um, this is the lovely Stephen White. 
as Fletcher. Robinson. Yeah. Little nod. Uh, now this, well, well, that's must, a character in the original book. No, it, it was Doyle's friend. It was a famous <laughs> thing. It still goes on about whether he stole the story from this man, although he clearly didn't. He's a journalist, and he was the man who had the original idea about the hound. Ah. Now, I must tell you, this bit is virtually verbatim from something that brilliantly fell into my lap uh, two Christmases ago at a party. I, I ended up talking to this guy who... And I can't remember, it wasn't, I wasn't talking about this, but he told me that his father had worked for the Ministry of Defence, and one day he didn't come home, and his family were frantic. They were about to call the police, and his dad turned up white as a sheet. He wouldn't talk about it. And a couple of days later, he said, I've seen some things today that I never want to see again. And eventually, he said, that he'd been taken somewhere like, like Porton Down, mm. and he'd seen sheep with plastic panels in their guts so you could watch their guts in action. Is that real? Yeah, yeah. and he'd seen uh, rabbits the size of dogs and dogs the size of horses. I just looked at him and thought, well, thank you. But this is quite a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that, and, and the, the origin of this, the, again, the modern equivalence for this story was about it's, if it's not a ghostly hound, what, are, what is the sort of thing that modern people although we're still very credulous, are frightened of. And I remember we talked about, Stephen said, it's, it has to be conspiracy theories, doesn't it? That's, that's what we mostly... Mm. It's not ghost stories now. They are, they're yeah. so, I mean, yeah, the alien landings and... Yeah. and <laughs> so this sort of thing, yeah. having that conversation, you're always talking to some, someone will say, they've always got a version of it, haven't mm. they, about something that happened. And it, these days, it tend, rather than clanking chains ghosts... It tends to be something like this about, oh, they're doing something, something hidden and secret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that suddenly became, yeah. that's what it must be. It must be... Or the aliens. Or the aliens, yeah. yeah. And actually, I'll, I'll do the story too, because I love this one. Um, uh, Michael Sheen told me this, and he got it from Billy Connolly, who got it from Richard Burton. So it's only three, stro- three handshakes away from Burton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the 60s, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor were quite close to Nixon, and they used to drink together. And uh, he used to come round to their place uh, and, and get drunk. And, and one night they'd just gone to bed. It was, an, it was an early night for the Burtons. And this car screeched up, probably driven by Todd Boyce and his CIA men. <laughs> and these CIA men, these men in black, got out and just pushed Nixon through the door and left. And the president just sat there, gibbering, white, shaking, sweating, couldn't speak. And, the, and Burton said, you, what's the matter, Dick? You, and he got him a drink, and they tried to calm him down. He couldn't speak. He was absolutely gibbering. Eventually, they sat, settled him down and put a drink into his hand. And he said, what? They said, what's the matter? And Nixon said, they showed me the alien. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. What about it? Well, that was, must have been one heavy night of drinking that Richard Burton came up with. Mm, <laughs> no. I reckon, I, my, I think the, the, the CIA men were thinking, hmm. What can we do to date the president? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's true. I hope it's true. Good. Yes. We'll never know, will we? Mm. Now, where is that? This was a gas works. You're going to keep asking these places. <laughs> yes. It was a gas works, and it's sort of... Um, it's been mothballed, hasn't it? Mm. Actually, the, the, you know, the proper tragedy about industry in this country is we visited loads of brand-new facilities oh. which had never even opened uh, lots of plaques saying opened by Rodri Morgan or something and then and then the recession hit and they just didn't happen all these amazing sort of computer facilities yeah. and things oh with really expensive equipment yeah, in some of them just they lying don't even know yeah. <laughs> this was a great place actually. so when you film do you kind of want to homage anything do you kind of have any secrecies I best probably question to Paul probably but do you sort of think that you want to reference certain things? or Well, in terms of Sherlock Holmes, there's always something, but it's most, it's more... I mean, I mean rather than the script, I mean, like, shot sequences, mm. the way it's kind of... Mm. Um, well, we did, actually, you did, we did it in... In Reichenbach. Reichenbach. Yeah. What? We, when we, Moriarty comes through. Oh, yeah. yes, we did. Uh, this, is, this is a very, very geeky one. <laughs> Heaven for a friend. Uh, the, uh, the, there's a sequence where Moriarty arrives uh, in Baker Street and uh, 
we lifted it wholesale from under an ancient Sherlock Holmes film uh, called Woman in Green with Basil Rathbone. Um, and it's a very, very brilliant little sequence. And Moriarty arrives, and uh, Sherlock Holmes is upstairs playing the violin. Moriarty creeps from the shadows, he starts going up the stairs, and suddenly the violin stops. And, all, and, and then Moriarty stops too, because he realises he's been clocked. He waits for a second, then the violin starts again. Uh, and then Moriarty continues the ascent. And that, it's all just one shot. It tells you the whole story. Mm. The whole idea is, you know, Sherlock knows that he's coming. He's cool with the fact he's coming. And Moriarty is cool with the fact that he knows he's coming. You know, it's all yeah, it's just yeah, a yeah. very, very clever. And if that little sequence had appeared in a Hitchcock movie, people would have written essays about it. Uh, <coughs> but it's uh, we, we've just taken that and, yeah. uh, and, and borrowed it. It's the same. You know, we talked about very early on about everything is canonical. All the film, everything mm. should be treated because there are some these little brilliant moments like that which are just not celebrated enough. And if and, and if we can sort of bring them to a wider audience, then mm. why not? Really, and I suppose quite a lot of scandal sort of riffs on private life. Private life. It's a sort yeah. of response in a way, isn't it? Yeah. It's a lovely Clive Mantle. Oddly enough, we have two little Johns in Hound of Baskerville, the Hounds of Baskerville. Do we? Yes. <laughs> Because Gordon Kennedy was, of course he was. was Little John in the recent Robin Hood and Clive Mantle was Robin Hood to Michael Prade. How strange. Mm. That is I always try and get Robin Hood references in. Where did you get that monkey from? <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's his urine sample. <laughs> Monkey see, monkey do. Uh, that's, where, that's Mark's there were, torture there were two, monkey. There were, there were two monkeys, wasn't there? Yes. I can't remember the names of Sunny the monkeys. Sunny and Cher or something. Like um, <laughs> one was very good at leaping up at bars. Yes. Like doing that. And the other one didn't like doing that. Yes. And one of them was very good at masturbation. <laughs> oh, God. And I think on the, on the gag reel we're never going to see, there are some extensive shots. <laughs> oh. <laughs> monkey see. <Good. laughs> what I love about this, Paul and, and Fabian did here, really... Was to take. They wanted a kind of Kubrick look to mm-hmm. this place, and the, sp- the the sort of stark white and all the and the flares uh, is actually by having a like fishing wire in the back of the lens, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you see the orange um, windows there yeah. because actually we used two different That's locations, right, yeah. and that was the way that we somehow linked them so it's the same ah. place. This is a proper. The it actress actually, is. Um, sorry, go on. That's Amelia Borden. Yes, mm. I've seen her on stage singing. She's got an amazing voice. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's amazing. Talented. Very talented. Do you notice there she does a brilliant thing. She, she rubs her rubs nose, indicating she's lying. I love that. That's that did you do. put that in the script? No, or? she just oh. did that. Man. Wow. Or either that or is that what, is that what like a pop psychology what people do when they're lying? Yeah, apparently it touches oh. the lips and the nose. Either that or she has a, 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 an infection. Of course, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was a, this is a, a, a clean room in another location, which is like a microchip facility wasn't it mm. so it was it was effectively what it was supposed to be as a clean room but it had these brilliant amber windows which we then carried on as a, as a thematic thing and now we see the first glimpse of the Diogenes Club how did you get the idea for all the writing to come up like this when you're kind of zipping through sequences That's Paul McGuigan um, did that in the, in the great game who's that I Handsome. Uh, mm. it's, a, it's a Hitchcock-like what, like cameo. What yeah. what what level of of <laughs> ego would uh, have a writer actually write a non-speaking <laughs> part for Mark Gatiss? I mean, really? Yeah, quite. Uh, was makes me laugh so much. <laughs> <laughs> you get a line of ADR at the end, though, don't you? But I mean, I just think, <laughs> think what are you doing? I, I give you a huge part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you I couldn't. Well, I couldn't follow that. <laughs> you see, they go into the lift. They come out of the lift in a totally different building. Yeah, that lift is a triangle. So that lift had Arwell's to keep moving design. with yeah, us. Yes. Yeah. Now, this is uh, the lovely Simon Paisley well, day, <clears> um, and he has, he's wearing a black beard, a sporting one, because Barrymore who's the butler in the original story, always has a black beard. But apparently in the mili- in the army, you can't have a beard. You can have them in the navy, and you can have a moustache, but you can't have a beard. But I decided that because it was a quasi-military thing, like unit, yeah. <laughs> that like it, was, unit. it was allowed. Okay. <laughs> of course it's like unit. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> what you find when you put in facial hair <laughs> yes. in the forces. <laughs> yeah, some of the other pictures were interesting. <laughs> Mark, people are going to start to think we are like geeks or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid it may be too late. 
trade show conference in Brussels, was it? Vienna. Yeah. Vienna. So I don't know. I mean, what do you what do you all think about what really goes on in these places? Because they do exist. Actually, well, another thing I did, I spoke to a scientist who actually had worked at Port and Down. So that's a real place. I didn't realise that. Port and Down is yeah, yeah. It's a famous. It's a weapons research facility. Lot. It's massive. Trying to cure the common cold. All kinds of things. It's, it's very secretive. And I and I I remember I spoke to him on the phone and and I. I sort of apologised for about ten minutes <coughs> about this, all these flights of fantasy, and then he sort of went, mm, "Well, anything's possible, really. It's only ethics." God. Which I then gave, I gave that line to Amelia again. It was yeah. pure quotes. Ethics are the only boundaries, and they're very flexible. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and he said when he was working there, you know, they had a couple of inspections a year, but the place is so vast. I mean, almost anything could go on underground or wherever. You know. Wow. Or is that them just trying to big up their part? It's clever, isn't it? Mm. That's that's the best way of of doing it, really. It's a bit like the idea that that UFO people uh, have is that actually it's in the government's interest to to keep conspiracy theories going because it it blurs the, it actually makes the real thing less um, tangible. You know, as long as it's like, it's of course, it, of course, it's madness. Yeah. Because that that uh, clouds the real issue. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, encourage yeah. people to look like geeks about UFOs yeah, to yeah. disguise the real thing. We're all guinea pigs. Yeah, in many ways, Russ. Mm-hmm. Let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> We're all victims of the bloody system. <laughs> now here's a funny thing because the because of moving things around, the collar up joke. Yeah, it goes in the wrong order. Was it, it's in the wrong order, but it still works. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Look, don't reawaken this conflict. <laughs> We're working on our marriage. And, uh, okay. How long does it take an episode on this? How long did we do it for? Uh, four weeks shooting. Four weeks. Yeah. And, and a bit. Yeah. <laughs> the bit being. It's always the bit. Well, you haven't quite finished it. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing scenes from basketball right at the end. Right? <laughs> well, yeah. well the, the, the first scene. The, the yeah. harpoon scene, yeah. What happens with the set of the uh, Baker Street? Is that just stored? Put in storage. Yeah. Oh, they yeah. put it in storage and then accidentally flood it. That's yeah, what they it's do. Flooded Every twice. Every time. Has it? Yeah. Mm. The, 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 so it gets damaged. So they put it in the special flood damage cupboard uh, and, <laughs> and it dig it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's in a container us. now. Is it? Yeah. And it's, it's, it'll be sea. hit by a meteorite. <laughs> <laughs> it's nature's way of telling us to redecorate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, isn't it funny? We spent all that time wondering, should Sherlock Holmes drive? Ah, oh, wow. And then we just mm. did. <laughs> so this is a real house. I realise that Martin, Martin doesn't No, no, a simple fat <laughs> man couldn't drive. I wrote it as, uh, Martin, absolutely, naturally, he should be the driver, and he can't drive. So then it was, well, that's all we could do now. <laughs> yes, so this amazing house, this was a long, involved oh. thing, because what we, what, what we needed was the patio for the porch light sequence. Oh, we should talk about this line quickly because I remember you yeah. telling me about this oh, yeah. line. Oh, this is a, this is a steal from Jaws. Mm. It's, it's exposition done by a master. Yes. Which is, uh, there's a scene in Jaws when Richard Dreyfus and Roy Scheider are out with all this amazing equipment, and he says, "This is, are you, are you rich? Yeah, mm. that's that's <laughs> all you need." To know. <laughs> yeah. And it's a sort of legacy of of him being Sir Henry, I suppose. He's, but um, we, I was I was adamant that we couldn't have this extraordinary house originally because. Although the patio was brilliant, it mm. was just too elaborate for Henry. And then it was well, that's that's the way to solve it. He's just rich, mm. and he never talks about it. Yeah, it solves a few other problems as well, like having a private um, shrink who pops around your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Paul loved the, um, the, the conservatory, the Victorian yeah. conservatory, yeah. which we hardly see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these wounds. <laughs> What was your approach to the character of Henry Knight? Uh, what was my approach to the character? Um, <laughs> approach appalled and, that you uh, had to have such a thing. Approach and character. You wouldn't have had, yeah, actually, yeah. you wouldn't have had any time, would you? Because you came straight, straight off. from him and her. Yeah, no, mm. I, I did. I went on tape for it during my lunch break. That's right. The end of my lunch break, and I mean the writing was all there, obviously. Bless you, Mark. And um, mm. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how. I, Found the character really. Do you start with the underpants? Or? Yeah, yeah, 
dressed him slowly. <laughs> um, and then I dressed him at the end. Um, no, I sort, I sort of wanted him to be... I didn't want him to be a gibbering wreck. I wanted him to be kind of, like, mature and not a geek and not like you'd think he was that. I just wanted him to be just really truthful and just someone who's really damaged and really haunted mm. and just wants to sort things out. And, you know, and his, his parents are both dead and... He lives in his own in this big house. And I thought from very early on that really in a very modern way what he has is survivor guilt. So mm -hmm. and in a way when you look at, when you look back at people in ghost stories uh, you might think that they're, they're frightened people mm -hmm. but maybe that's that's sort of a form of what it is. He, yeah. he's, he has no explanation for it and it's haunted him all his life yeah. uh, even though he's gone away and come back etc. His life just um, seems like it's therapy as well. Yeah, you know everything's yeah. therapy and he's just working out and yeah. So the ending is, is is a happy ending for him. Isn't yes, it's it? certainly. You hope yeah, that he, he gets, goes off and just kind an of. Answer, yeah. I think he'll still need therapy for the rest of his yeah. life, but you think he'll be a bit more kind of secure he, and maybe get pets, a relationship. Yeah. Or any pets. No, no cats or dogs. <laughs> maybe he gets bird. haunted by a giant panther. <laughs> 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 in an ironic twist. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and this, of course, is a reference to the original story um, with uh, Selden, the convict, who's signalling on the moor. And it is my single favourite redeployment of uh, Armored Doyle. So we quite often do in this show is take an element of Doyle and do something slightly cheeky with it or do it the wrong way round. Or, you know, uh, but this is the funniest one. What? Dr. Franklin. Oh, right. Bob, yeah. Seems pretty concerned about you. Uh, he's a warrior, bless him. He's been very kind to me since I came back. You knew your father? Yeah. But he works at Baskerville. Didn't your dad have a problem with that? Well, mates are mates, aren't they? I mean, look at you and John. What about us? Well, I mean, he's a pretty straightforward bloke, and you... Well, they, they agreed never to talk about work, Uncle Bob and my dad. Do you as hollow? We, we got back at what five o'clock in the morning or something to the hotel and couldn't get in. Couldn't get in. Some mm -hmm. utter fool, which turned had out to be accidentally. <laughs> yes, that's what I was going with that. <laughs> had accidentally locked you out of the uh, the bed and breakfast, and uh, you, oh, well, that was the end. That was the, the official. Yeah, I was sitting up in that night. Drinking. Yes, yeah. I think yeah. you were. Well, we got, yeah, we got really confused because the guy said, <laughs> "That's leave right, the key yeah. or don't leave the key," and he, we neither of us could work it I out. Think you were I think we should lock it. You may be too drunk to. Yeah, we should lock it in case anyone wants to come in. But you know, it just felt weird to leave it unlocked. Yeah. With the, the like teal Japan. there and the bar and everything, it just felt <laughs> yes. strange. It's like Japan, don't we? <laughs> but we were just, it was at that time, when you, I mean, all night, you think, oh, I can't wait for yes. my bed. And you can just see where your bed is, but yeah. you can't get in. And that feeling of I'm just, just like some raucous singing oh. from inside. <laughs> so we just bedded down in the car. For several hours until... Is that what we're calling it these yeah. days? <laughs> now, this is an actual, like, phenomenon collapsed... Dell, is it? Like a it's an extraordinary... I mean, it's a natural rock formation. It must be formed by water inland, as it were, a, a river or something, because it looks like... It's like coastal erosion. It's just the whole thing is uh, a great big sort of punch bowl, isn't it? Mm. And really dangerous. Yeah, there was no... <laughs> like, we, we put... You put, like, sticks yeah, and stuff sticks. up, but yeah. you tumbled across it, and you could just be walking your yeah. dog and not know the area, Boom. and it's literally like yeah. a... What and a nightmare like to, to access for anything like lighting one. We had that huge... Oh, yeah. well, that was a zip um, wire just then, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It took a long, yeah. long time to kind of perfect. But it's a great discovery, actually, because in the absence of actually filming the climax on a tour on Dartmoor, it's, it's just a great place to, to do it mm. rather than just on a random piece of moorland or something. Mm -hmm. It's got a real character to it. So we talked, didn't we, about how... I mean, for this series of three, Sherlock and love, Sherlock and fear, Sherlock and death, and this, this was an area he wanted to play with. Um, the the arch rationalist is going to be confronted by what appears to be impossible. 
So what does he do about it? It was also, it was the problem with, wasn't it, changing the structure of the story. Normally, Sherlock Holmes does not come to Dartmoor, yeah. or doesn't appear to come to Dartmoor until the very, very end. So uh, having hit upon the idea rightly, I think, to take Sherlock Holmes there straight away, because, yeah. you know, the kids are not going to be happy with Benedict Cumberbatch being absent. Of the <laughs> uh, we them, but, but of course, then you say, well, what Sherlock Holmes does in the story when he turns up again is, oh, for goodness sake, it's not really a ghost dog. It's just somebody with a dog. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and the story faintly deflates. Yeah. And you see why Doyle kept him off stage for yeah. so long, because he's, he's the man who's going to come and just basically end the fun. So the problem was, <laughs> yeah, what you did was that if we actually have him see the hound and get scared, they think, yeah. oh, hang on, his presence is actually up to the ante yeah. because yeah. Uh, the arch rationalist has seen a ghost dog, mm -hmm. and that means well, all bets are off. What the hell is going on? And as he's, oh, he has this is his sort of crisis moment, uh, and um, it was Steve's idea. I had this de this deduction was hanging around mm. as as it's a, a brilliant deduction, as a good deduction, yeah. but it was like it, w it didn't work because it. It, the, at this point in the story, he wouldn't be doing it, and, and Steve had the idea of using it as as a weapon. So he actually is proving to John that he's still got it by yeah. doing this brilliant deduction about the couple on the table next door. Um, mm -hmm. And I love this scene. I think and I think Bendix oh, yeah. great in this scene. It's, it's really very powerful. Well. It's about day yeah, three, it was. wasn't it? It's really yeah. powerful. And I actually turned up on set at this point, which I thought was just amazing of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's very kind. <laughs> It's also, uh, what's it called, that the split diop diopter? Split diopter, yeah. which... Uh, enables which you to have both characters both in focus. focus at the same which time. is used a lot in 60s films. It's, it's a lot of Dr. Zhivago things that both are in focus at the same time. It's actually split lens. It's really beautiful. Um, I like the links between the scenes, because the last scene ended with me with my hands up yeah, in, yeah. like, prayer position. Then it starts like yeah, he's absolutely. doing right now. Yeah. This scene starts like that, and that actually links a few ways through. I think there's a scene where it goes from... One thing, and then Doctor Mortimer. Um, no, it's Louise Mortimer, isn't it? Yeah. She references what the scene has gone before the last yeah. position. Oh, that's very clever. Mm. That's very clever. Mm. Very impressed. Mm. But he's uh, he's sort of saying, I, I can't have seen it, but I did see it, and therefore, for his mind, that that's his way into the case, isn't it? Really, yeah. is to say, well, so what is the explanation? There must. There are, there are mm. a dozen explanations. I will, I will get the right one. Mm. And it all sort of plays back in things that we're very keen on. I mean, almost more importantly than the modernising of Sherlock Holmes, he's still a young man. Yes, he's still forming. forming. He's yeah. not the big yeah. monolithic Sherlock Holmes yet. He's still encountering things like encountering Irene and wondering if actually he, that's what he should be doing or you know, actually facing the idea that he's capable of being tremendously frightened. Yeah, I yeah. wouldn't believe this moment really in, with, of a 50-year-old Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. I think yeah. he would know, yes, of course I can yeah. be frightened, but he's still, he's still in the, uh, on, the, on the training slopes, as it were, yeah. which but makes it, him more... There's more to play with there, isn't there? It, it is. A, it's an eternal there problem, of course, isn't it? You that, understand. Uh, it's a bit like the Doctor. Mm. That, that, that if you if you also accept his universal brilliance, then what's to stop him just shutting down the story? Mm. Uh, and that's that's always a problem, especially with Sherlock Holmes, because his, his breadth of intelligence and, and knowledge is that he will just spoil it, as you say. No, they, 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 they are plot killers, um, characters like the, the Doctor and Sherlock Holmes, because they, they do turn up and say, what you want them to do is be brilliant and funny and engaging, and you think, well, that's it. I finished now, and I'm only mm. on page seven. Um, so <laughs> that's why dull stories are so short. <laughs> <laughs> and but you, but then you don't. I mean, the reason that, that flipping this round works so well is you get to see him being utterly brilliant and utterly clever and do something spectacular, and yet he's clearly going to pieces. Yeah, yeah. And John's getting increasingly annoyed about it. That Christmas jumper <laughs> idea was in. I, that was the very first draft, draft of your of, first one of the original version of episode two. And it, it's it's Sue it. loved that deduction, yeah. and it, you, you asked for it to come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's like only uh, you would only wear that if you tried to impress someone. Probably, again, <laughs> I think they found that it was quite a problem getting a really yeah. dodgy Christmas jumper in yeah. what was this bay? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they, they weren't really nasty enough, and in the end, I, I think it's a bit too obviously Christmassy. But it, it was a, it was slim pickings for <laughs> bad jumpers. And <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> oh, that'll go. Take that out. <laughs> <laughs> how long did it take you to find the kind of style of how you wanted them both to dress? Oh, that's a good question. 
And uh, I, I, I pass it. Over. Yeah. We'll understand those things. <laughs> well, with, uh, with well, the coat, we wanted something yeah. iconic, yeah. but modern, but without being modern just for the sake of it. Yeah. Um, you didn't want to put him in a papa jacket. I mean, it's in, mm. in the original stories, it, all it really says is that he has a certain quiet primness of dress. And in the illustrations, he, he wears what an average Victorian man would wear mm. with a frock coat, and, and he looks very neat. So that sort of formed the suit, didn't mm. it, uh, with a bit of colour. But the coat is one of those things. <laughs> and it and Ray Holman, who was the original costume designer, found this incredible coat, and you just... You know it when you see it. Yeah, you do. Yeah. He put that little detail of the, yeah, red, the red buttonhole yeah. in. Actually, he just sewed that in, which is lovely. But it, I mean, it's just it's a hero coat. Mm -hmm. And even but, they, but they, we were just saying earlier, actually, they haven't made any more, and they should do because they'd yeah. sell them all. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. We also did a funny thing, because we knew, unlike last time, that these stories weren't going to be set in the depths of winter, and in fact, eventually we would be filming in the summer. That maybe Sherlock should have a. A, a summer version, a lighter weight mm. one, and and Sarah Arthur made. We had one, one made, yeah. Mm, just didn't work. At all. Really, it has to have the weight, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It looked curious. What time Very of year was curious. this when we shot it? This was May, right? But eventually mm. we were on into July, weren't we? Yeah. Here we are. Hmm. Well, we finished in August. August, we? yes. Yeah. God, yes. And that's why we don't do more than three a year. Yeah. <laughs> well, three years is actually an epically large number when you consider that they are 90 minutes long yeah. and really good. <laughs> Stop whinging. <laughs> Why did you decide on 90 minutes per... That was BBC's decision because oh, right. we, we were commissioned to do a series of six, 60s originally uh, while we made the pilot. Mm -hmm. And probably, I think, because of the success of Wallander, which had worked mm. in that Oh, format. That, oh yeah, yeah it was. Oh, right. Um, that was the decision. We were really pulled out of our, our read through for Doctor Who, weren't we? Uh, with you on the phone saying, "Yeah, uh, yeah. would you? We, they, they want to do, it, but they want to do it as three nineties. Yeah, yeah. And we just, and we just said, well, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah well, the way Alice saw that out later, but yeah. we'll do it. Well, yes. What was your first plan then? Like six sixties, six sixties. <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, so it would have been six. I mean, that's what the pilot is. It's a sixty-minute version of the first episode, um, and uh, was, was good and all that. But I think, I think ninety has really suited it. Yes, it, it really mm. does. It just gives you space, doesn't it, to mm. do the mm. scenes that you'd never get round to. Mm. I mean, it, gives, it does give you scale, but we'd never have that Christmas Day scene in a 60-minute no. episode in a million years, would you? But also to this is such a nice it like a film. Oh, this is a, I think yeah, this is, I have to say, be, I have to say, well, two things, beautifully shot by Paul McQuick and absolutely amazingly mm. shot, but it's a brand-new scary idea from Mark Gatiss. This, this is, I remember reading this and thinking, this is new. Huh. Uh, the security light coming on and something's out there. This is absolutely new. I'm reading a new scary thing. Well, that's fake. What about the performance? The performance mm. is Yeah, the well, only... do you know there was always one thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember the rest? Absolutely brilliant. Well, course. this came about, it actually happened uh, where I write in my house that the security light is very eccentric. This makes me jump every time. Yeah, this is. Uh, I jumped, but I. And it just, <laughs> it, just, uh, <laughs> it just popped on and you just go, whoa, what? There's something has caused that. Probably just a squirrel. I love the music the coming in. Well. This is great. Yeah. This should be good for my show reel. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that, Rush? But that because that I actually talked you through. You did, it. yeah. You sitting there behind the sofa. I mean, for yeah. I know behind the kitchen, the kitchen island, you were sitting forever. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until eventually, I I, I stripped the stage direction down because I thought I think we've got it now. We probably <laughs> know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets off the sofa. And <laughs> he gets the gun. He is frightened. <laughs> 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 But that was I just missed it, but that was a scene with all the dogs. Everything was kind of dog themed on yes, the television, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. We've got some more dogs in there. Mm. This is the lovely Sasha. Is uh, the dishiest Doctor Mortimer? Yes, yeah, and uh, we used that anyway because uh, that that's how Sherlock gets into say, yeah. Why should I go and interview her? that? Because she looks like this. Martin has a Martin has a real thing about talking to himself as a character. Uh, with that people don't really do it. Although I have to I say, do I it do it all the time. I'm afraid that might mm. be just that. <laughs> I was doing this morning. I was taking Bunsen for a walk, and I was going through a list in my mind. I thought, I am actually doing this. If I, he would never do this in a mm. film, it looks too ridiculous. <laughs> do you know but what actually, I was acting though. I always walk on the street doing lines and really kind of exaggerated yeah, yeah. facial mm. expressions. <laughs> yes. People must think I've yeah. got something serious. You do have a reputation for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> Crazy Toby. <laughs> Talk it over. <laughs> yeah. Steve Joe. has that, and, and you walk around, depending whether it's comedy or drama, you walk around either laughing hysterically to yourself in the street. Or, or crying. In, in the or days or when I was writing, <laughs> so like, stabbing people. Yeah. Thunder. In the days when I was writing comedy, I just looked 
happy but mental. <laughs> I just <don't> know <laughs> and you know what you're going to. But then when I was putting them writing Doctor Who, is the worst thing to write because you you you, 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 end, you end up just seething. You're saying, "So, Doctor," <laughs> and, and you realise you've done that. And I remember once uh, going to a uh, funny. We were waiting for a plane and uh, taking my laptop off to a corner, as I thought, and thought, "Right, I can just do some more Doctor Who." And I was doing it out loud. I was going, the Vashta Narada, they are over, we're marauding the library. Oh. And when I finally got up, and there was a guy sitting directly behind uh. me. He's, and he was sitting a little rigidly. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I must have, I don't know why he didn't have me arrested. <laughs> must have sounded like a mad terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> like when he sounds like a terrorist. Yeah. Apparently, the Vashta Narada are going to strike. <laughs> the Vashta Narada. <laughs> he throw. <laughs> That tour is actually called Ham Tour. It is, and of course, oh. Back Fans is where the Sontaran experiment was shot. Oh. I didn't know until we finished filming because I, I didn't know what I would have done differently. Except You'd have phoned the, me. Touched from. From. Yes, I know. <laughs> and said, look, they yes. where I am. So at this point, he nicks my sugar, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Your sugar here. Now we are about... This is the, this is the crucial point of um, the word itself yeah. being wrong and therefore the, the key to it all. The hound. Yeah. Last night. Why did you say what were your thoughts about how he dressed? I remember you had some... Who, Henry? Yeah, yeah particular thoughts about him. Because yeah. we, we didn't get out to talk about John Watson, but there's a similarity there both... I think quite... that's what it was originally. I was going to mm. be... We, we are quite similar in, in mm. clothes, though, mm. but I wanted him, like, in a barber You got a job or... lot. Right, OK. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's just the nod to the past, isn't it, of what... Yeah, there's a the nod... You have, he's... like, a Norfolk jacket. Which yeah. is a, which is an absolutely a modern Norfolk, but it could equally be a, an Edwardian. Yeah, coat, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's it's, kind of he's rich and he's kind of well, eccentric yeah, yeah. and country, yeah. yeah. And but uh, yeah, there's a sort of um, there's a there's a kind of um, preppiness about it as yeah. well. This is the first day of shooting. And it was. Yes, it was. I remember just getting these these rushes through. Because I was looking after the kids while you were bedding down in a car. <laughs> He's coming back. <laughs> yes. um, I, uh, I, cool. I just so excited to suddenly see Martin and Benedict say lines ah. they hadn't said yeah, before. I know. <laughs> so used to the other three. <laughs> so I was like, oh no, the back. <laughs> I, I love this. I love this. <laughs> I, I must say, I don't <laughs> like that coat, Martin. No, we called it the scarecrow coat, yeah. didn't we? we it's we because almost of the string hanging. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 it does look as though it, it, you could pull those strings yeah. and yeah. parachute or something. Yeah. Maybe it cropped up in the last week, didn't it? We'd, we'd managed to yeah. sort of oust it. I don't I? think it... <laughs> it feels wrong for John. Yeah. And it, it, the string thing does make me, make me think of, of farmers and all creatures great and small who didn't have a belt. Just have a piece of string around their coats. I mean, this episode particularly, we, we dart between um, Wales and Dartmoor all over the place, don't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shot, we shot. You saying this is the first thing you shot of this episode is just of the whole so many thing. actors, yeah. like, you do end up shooting, like, a big meaty end oh, of episode yeah, scene, like, on the first on. day, which is mm. always so challenging. And this is a steady cam scene as well. It was very tough. Um, it wasn't it around the church originally as well. It was a sort of walk through the village, but mm. it was it's such a pretty place. And actually, f- it, um, for Wales, unusually, it's a very English-looking village, uh, which was great, wasn't it? The mm. stone and everything, and just having the church in felt correct. You are amazing. You are fantastic. Yes, all right. Don't have to overdo it. <laughs> Never be the most luminous of people, but as a conductor of light, you are unbeatable. Which is. <laughs> I, I've detected a type. That, that was the same car as that woman was sitting in in the great game who was going to blow up. <laughs> I'm seeing a whole subplot here yeah, now. Nah. I changed my car. <laughs> I'm becoming obsessed with John's coat now. I've never really noticed it before. <laughs> just thinking, why has he got all those bits? And what did they all do? <laughs> that, that Wait, one, that, it's that Rupert. Be back, yeah. It's Rupert mm. Graves. He yeah. actually, did, was he turned up or was he turned anyway? He did come, he just come, come back, back from, a job, from, from Guadalupe. Mm. Death in Paradise, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, so and, he had a turn uh, anyway. And uh, it was impossible to ignore. So he said, so write it in. Did, oh, OK, <laughs> yeah. so you actually wrote yeah. it in because of the turn. Actually, and I tried to make it mm. more canonical because he says, your brown is a nut, which is what Stamford mm. says about what. Yeah, in, in the Stanford's Stanford, Stanford, yeah. Yeah. But he looks great, doesn't he? Mm. <laughs> but this is also a thing. The Strad is in the original story very briefly, but... <laughs> we we wanted to um, last year we, we we had a decision to have a different inspector in episode two to, to vary it, but we'd already started to realise 
how lovely it was to have a team to have mm. a precinct mm. and actually the idea that he's been sent down by Mycroft to, to spy on him and then somehow actually appeals to Sherlock well it's the, yeah, it's, the, it's the thing well first of all we didn't want the same inspector just because it wouldn't always be the same policeman didn't it but once we hit on the idea they always make sure it is yeah. because yeah. Sherlock has to be handled and Lestrade yeah, yeah, is my, hand like, exactly. and really I can't think because Rupert is so good yeah and such a leading man that you know it really makes it feel as though there's another series going on somewhere called Lestrade where he <laughs> unsuccessfully <laughs> solves crimes he goes home to his wife and on, didn't uh, solve it again it was rubbish <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be on Monday nights <laughs> <laughs> I like this very much because it looks like a clumsy attempt by Sherlock to, to yeah. do the, mm. the basic niceties but he's actually poisoning him <laughs> yeah. yes he's actually taking a step further into the dark <laughs> How did you come up with the uh, the gay landlords or the pub? The gay the landlords. The gay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was Sue's idea landlords. actually. Yeah. Sue's idea because uh, I think the first draft it was a, a sort of blousy. Uh, I wrote a sort of blousy landlady, and again it was one of those things. If you think about, you know, it, to make it more modern, so you're already you're already in a, in a sort of spooky village. Mm. You don't want to be a sort of uh, hammer like uh, landlady or something. Uh, I remember you saying maybe yeah. a gay couple have moved, moved down. down. Or it's not a gay agenda, Russell. No matter what you, <laughs> no what you want. <laughs> a charming spring and autumn relationship. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> little John and little John. <laughs> So this is anyway. This is all part of the thing, wasn't it? Then, of course, the reason it's eventually called the Hounds of Baskerville is there are there are essentially two dogs, same dog, but one of them is um, is uh, is the uh, the drug induced hallucination yeah. of this vicious dog. Yeah. Do you think people have gone back and discovered the stories because of the series? They definitely have. Yeah. They have. We've yeah. had letters about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, you yeah. did a signing the other day, didn't mm. you? And. Uh, we, we've huge. we've yeah, done yeah. and that was just me and Mark. Yeah. They had, uh, signing what DVD covers? No, uh, uh, the reprinted uh, the stories, but <coughs> with Martin and Benedict on the cover. So it's and, really? and, we've done and you've done forwards, yeah. and we've done forwards, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> See where I rank us? Yeah, <laughs> and we because, did forwards, but they, there was photographs of that because uh, because Conan Doyle can be bothered to do signings. Yeah, it was, we thought we did, but it was yeah. we had two hours solid signings. Amazing, uh, and oh, people skinny Russian girls. To be honest, they were all girls. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Audience profile, girls. Rich large. So this is, this is big girls. in Russia. There were four. Yeah. There were so four I'm going to be big in Russia. You're going to be big in but Russia. Amazing. Yeah. But with skinny Russian girls. Yeah. There were four men, two of whom said, "I'm here on behalf of my girlfriend." <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same girlfriend. So it's the actual Arthur Conan Doyle story, but just with a new cover, which yeah. is going to yeah. sell yeah. it more because people. But are honestly, we've had. We, I mean, the, the, I know the sales of the books, uh, the original stories, have gone up. Uh, we get constantly fantastic things from people. I had an incredibly moving letter from a woman whose son is profoundly dyslexic who's never read a book mm. and he's read them all now yeah. because he loves the show and it, it's, mm. God, it's, it's fantastic. For people to go back to Doyle because of the success of mm. that show. And the one thing that we've brilliant. actually declined to do or have done is that there's going to be no novelizations of this. There'll be no book version of this. There'll be no... Uh, they'll, never get, they'll never get the scripts never get printed. Well, I wouldn't mind the scripts being printed. Yeah. That'd be fine. But, oh. but, but they shouldn't be adapted as novels. If you want to read Sherlock Holmes' novels, you should read the originals. Right. You should read the Doyle ones. Have the other episodes been released as scripted books you can buy? Yeah, you can I buy. I don't think there's that much to I mean, I think we're talking about putting them online, actually. Yeah. How oh, do you? Do you know the problem? We haven't done it. We, we, did, we, we did a script book, book of Doctor Who yeah. the first year, and it didn't really sell. Right. Also, because they're immense. Get DVD. They are immense. They, no matter how what you format them as, they there's a lot of stuff there, mm. and that's a hefty tome. I think it's. I think. In sales terms, they're interesting to other writers or mm -hmm. uh, mm. prospective writers. And in once case, they were well interesting, to, well, yeah. when you mm. couldn't get a, even a video, that was the only version of the show you could take yeah. home. That yeah. was exciting. Mm. Mm. 24 hours is what I negotiated, not a second more. I may have to comply with this order, but I don't have to like it. And this is the, the alien reference from anyway. Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> We had a debate. I mean, they were called Stan and Ollie, I think. Yeah, for it. Yeah, let's call them Abbott and Costello. Simon did an episode of Being Human oh, where he, he played a medium and uh, yeah. he's actually a charlatan and then Annie the ghost actually gets through to him I.e. he is a medium satire oh she gets oh that's brilliant yeah and her mum turns up that's nice <laughs> here we are the lovely concert 
<laughs> they can stick it. We can all stick it. <laughs> my family, though, my dead mm-hmm. parents, mm-hmm. and friend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm doing a quick photo of fondle. <laughs> <laughs> Desperate to sleep. That was just you, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, this was early yeah. morning. <laughs> just night. a bit bored. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Now, uh, this is the sort of second big suspense sequence and was originally written, here we go, this is a long story, <laughs> this is what DVD coverage is for, mm-hmm. yes. this is originally written to take place in a cold storage meat locker uh, and it was all part of the vegetarian meat uh, oh, yeah, yeah. axis that they went to this place to investigate the fact that the pub was actually buying meat. Was that the read-through draft? I don't think so. It might have been, because it lasted it a long time. It was there, it was there, there very late. It. It, <coughs> certainly it, it. Mm. Right. it might have certainly been the, might have been the first version you saw when you, yeah. when you, when, when you got sent it. Yeah, right. I think yeah, I, yeah. I think. But it was, it was the same sort of thing of wanting to come up with some, I thought, I don't think I've seen that before. And, mm. and the idea of doing, and of course, knowing that Sherlock had already, uh, this was done. This was shot really months, late in the studio. <laughs> Along in the same night as Lara's wardrobe, and yeah. Kind of, um, and uh, Sherlock, we only knew, only knew how to have Sherlock was experimenting on, so he wanted to put John in a certain place to observe him. And he went to Recky, a meat storage locker in Bristol, and that was cold. Wasn't it? it was. <laughs> well, do you remember the the one they actually said pop in there for a second? And it's like it's like something from a te- like an Edgar Allan Poe mm. story. Where you go in for a joke and they just close the door. Oh. It, was, it was an ultra, ultra cold one for like instant freezing that I've never experienced anything like it. Mm. You just go to the threshold and just go, <laughs> <laughs> and then flee back out. But we did. We went through all that, and then we went for the second recce. That's when they told us that you it would take 24 hours to cool it down, mm. and we'd have to pay for a week. Yeah, and then we wouldn't. We weren't. We wanted to get all the breath and the. And it wouldn't show. Mm. Yeah, and it wouldn't show. It's so cold; it doesn't show. It's like the Antarctic. Um, you need moisture, so you actually have to put moisture in the air to make it show. Mm. And then by then it was like, should we do it somewhere else? Yeah. <laughs> but also this, the light wasn't it? I think was that Paul's idea that suddenly you can actually light can be as frightening rather and than scary darkness. It, yes, absolutely. Instead of dark. And then then it moved to the other lab to to uh, Amelia's lab. And then this one, as a as a as a, a place to play, became so much more exciting. Mm. I just sat down and, and totally rewrote it exactly to suit everything that happens in this place. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, I love it. I think it's so spooky. And the silence as well. What's it going to say? No, it's not working. So it's uh, it's it's good to be uh, flexible. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a lot of the equipment was in the other lab, wasn't it? And they had to keep putting yes, it all yeah. through. <laughs> was this done at night or during the day? This was all day. day. Yeah, all day. Was yeah. It? Yeah. No, the night really was mostly done when the days were the shortest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oddly enough. When you had like max five hours. You saw a lot of dawns. Yeah. Beautiful dawns. Mm-hmm. It's really short nights. I think most of my stuff was at night. A lot of it, so <laughs> it was I was kind of jet lagged yeah. when I finished the job. We were trying to help you. <laughs> so this music is all scored by. Arnold. No, this is the music you're listening to. Is the tenth music. Oh, oh okay, right. This is strange. So confusing. Way. <laughs> so again, faithful viewer. <laughs> oh, you are hearing the right music. We are hearing the wrong music. I don't know why we're bothering to tell you anything. <laughs> we haven't even seen the show you're looking at. That's the truth. No yeah. one in this room has seen the show that yeah. you are looking at. We are explaining to you a show that you have seen and we haven't. This is that we're actually just watching drawings. Yes. <laughs> who, who scores this, Dennis? The theme tune is Arnold. Who does the scoring? Oh, David, uh, David and, and, and Michael. Michael David Price yeah. is uh, Amazing. So they're yeah. doing that at the moment. Or is it done? It's all done, it's, all done. Oh, it's right. just not laid back on the tape. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you, this is really Sherlock at his most callous, mm. uh, as I said, which is rather pleasing. Literally, laboratory conditions. <laughs> he traps his best friend yeah. in here, closes all the exits to see if he can scare him. 
mm. and, and whether that then produces the visual hallucination that he expects. Do you ever go to the recordings for the music? Mm. Do you? Yeah. Is I it amazing? To all of them. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. I've never been. I go to the strings. Really? Yeah. And it's in an old uh, in studios. converted church. Yeah. Yeah. I once took old church. my um, it's lovely. Uh, David uh, was doing Bond and um, mm. uh, my parents were visiting and I, I rang him and said, can we come down? And it, it was the most brilliant thing because having always gone to see Bond films as a family but, um, and then eventually particularly me and my dad to go and listen to mm. The World Is Not Enough being recorded wow. it was like wow fantastic and then after about half an hour doing the same cue I thought I'll leave you to it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's amazing how they do it bear in mind they just arrived that morning and see all the music but the it's best score is isn't it in that way yeah, you spot really brilliant pieces that just sell the whole thing. The best scoring is you don't even realise you're listening to mm. music. No, yeah. Or or it's big and you really know you're listening. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Mean, that? I think Martin's fantastic in this. Yeah. And, and again, playing a very practical, rational man who was scared out of his wits mm. and he can't quite work out why. I think and they using the phone. We have a little key lighter thing, but it is it is actually mostly the phone. Um, providing only light source. Yeah, Fabi and the um, DP is great. Sometimes they'd be like, you could look at something and be huge lighting job, and you think well, we can't afford that. And then they'd say, for instance, the one with um, Ari Nedler went in the uh, in the execution thing. And he goes, or I could light it with the lorry lights. And you go, oh, that sounds better. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> practical solutions. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm really pleased with, though, is, is, um, is just how scary it is. And mm. as I say, given that it's, 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 the, it's, the, horror, it's the most horrific yeah. of, of Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, although horror is a big part of... It runs like a scarlet thread through Doyle. Yeah. Uh, is actually um, that these sequences are really successful. Mm. And then there's a silly story about a rabbit. But this is also <laughs> true. What, what do you mean? Um... I, I, in my researches, early on, I discovered that a scientist and an artist had collaborated to make rabbits glow in the dark just for fun. Did true. it work? Yeah, it's, 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 it is a jellyfish gene. In fact, it's if, you, get, if you go on the computer and you put in glowing rabbits, rabbit, you'll find it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> wow. I know. Why? Turner Prize. Yes. That, that <laughs> yeah. actually deserves a Turner Prize. Big time. <laughs> Lovely Amelia. How do you feel about the casting processes of oh. this? Is it quite intense and do you spend a <laughs> sound like a alarm here? Is it do you spend a long time trying to like really find Well yeah, absolutely. It's um it's always an interesting thing because you're dealing with a, a very high profile show mm -hmm. now from the beginning, you know. And you want to cast up but at the same time get people who are absolutely right for it and uh it's just it's just very interesting. I love casting, I love it. But also it's great <laughs> having a um a writer who's also an actor because you get great reading in. <laughs> yeah. I have to say I also <laughs> I, do, I also do try and I'm very kind to people because I know it's like and that I find the whole thing I mean I've done it and other things but not as intense as intensively as on Sherlock and um I know exactly what it's like, and it gives you such a different perspective. perspective. Yeah. It so does. You I said it the other day for a play. I'm really reading in with just two girl parts and me, and reading with all these girls, and I, I they're all amazing. And I could never make a decision. <laughs> and I was just like, it's so tough. Mm. But I was really like, and in the end, everyone else, like the director, was a bit like tired. But I was yeah. every time they come in, I was like, hello, yeah, how yeah. are you? Because yeah. I thought, if that's me, yeah. and I walk yes. into a room and everyone's kind of lethargic yeah. after lunch, you mm. just sort of feel it. But and equally, like, you, on the other way around, you think. How many times have I said, said this? this. Yeah. How many times have I read this? Or, mm. or, or, you know, I know this is the last person of the day and I think we've already seen who it was or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you've, got yeah. to, you've got to go, you've got to do that. Definitely. How many Henrys did you see? Mm, only one. <laughs> <laughs> Not me, someone else. <laughs> yeah, he pulled it out. And then, then yeah. Yeah. who was in the building? <laughs> <laughs> Who's in Twickenham Studios? <laughs> um, now, what can I say about this? 
got to uh, the, uh, the mine palace. Mine palace. Uh, this came about because I remember having a, in, in the midst, probably in Cornwall, in the midst of a, an absolute crisis of intractability of the house. And I said, but he's got to find, he's got to find out what it is, but he can't just bloody look it up. Mm. What is it? And you said, why did we do a mind palace? Because we both read Darren Brown's yeah, yeah. book. Well, mind palace isn't a... No, it's, no, 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 it's, it's a really interesting yeah. idea. It's how, it's how you store information in your brain. It's Hannibal Lecter does it, and uh, it's a it's a brilliant it's a it's a real idea. Mm. Have you, you ever done it? Can you, you do it? No, I'm far too stupid. So, what's the theory behind it then? You kind of you you've, you've, is it like you associate a colour with something and you remember a, a word, or is it? Yeah, like, it's, more, it's a map, isn't it? Really, it's you actually create map. rooms in your head and you put things in them and and you remember those things. I mean, it's it's a but yes, I'm to say the least truncating the explanation but it's mm. worth reading Darren Brown's book on it as well. wow and, in, and Lecter does it at one point uh, in Hannibal or Silence of the Lambs he has a he has to go into a hospital and at some point he has studied the layout of the hospital and has set aside a room in his in his mind palace and he just has to get there and he's sitting on a plane taking himself somewhere else and he just goes down the corridor left right past that memory and then opens the door and he can remember it because he's placed it somewhere you know, I mean, happily, we can get away with murder because it's sharp, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it is a real technique. I think we should revisit it. Actually, I think it's an interesting mm. thing. You know, you could actually, if you did a visualization of it, Sherlock, yes. uh, you know, actually walking around it <clears throat> while talking to somebody, and you cut to them, yes. listening to him, and he's sitting there with his eyes shut. Oh, we talked yeah, about that, yeah. but we couldn't afford it. No, <laughs> yeah. Mine just sounds so kind of like well, that's such a typical. But like, they, that was the nice thing because that that is what it's it? called. Mm, but yeah. then it provided an extra joke for me yeah. that, that actually, of course, he wasn't he wasn't talking about mine cottage. Mm. It, yeah. it was just a palace. <laughs> 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 We shot this about four o'clock in the morning, I think. Yeah. I love this, it's brilliant. Proper nightmarish, isn't it? It's amazing how you did all that running and turning around, actually, wasn't it? Well, thanks. <laughs> without, falling, <laughs> without falling over. I know. <laughs> oh, do you know, uh, Mark, do you remember? She died. Yes. And she, she died at the rig through. And it was ages later. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And yeah. we just, we just, we were never happy, were yeah, we? Yeah, we're yeah. constantly. Because he suddenly realised he was having breakfast at the end. You think, but you wouldn't. Really he failed. That was the thing. He'd fail yeah. if she died. He yeah. failed. So we was it? Yeah. You were there. I was home looking after the kids mm. while you were bedding down with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, and, and we were, but I was we were, there. Yes, that's true. Mm. Uh, and we were just talking about how we could resequence and yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was like, she's gonna have to and survive. And it's now. it's so much yeah, better yeah, this way. Definitely. So definitely. much. Better. And there was a flashback that we shot of um, <clears throat> Clive Mantle talking to me, telling me I've got to kill it, got to kill the hound. Yeah. That's not in mm. it now, is it? No, it's gone. Was that no. gonna? Was that meant to? Co- I see. When I watched it, I'm. I remembered that. Was that going to come at the end and that was like a reference summing up the new one of the whole piece or was it a... It was in the explanation of... Mm-hmm. It was, so, right. Yeah, yeah. I get one of the yeah. uh, one of the most intractable things about this intractable oh, story oh, was the oh, sheer oh, amount of sodding explanation we yeah. had at the end. How many mm-hmm. times we, oh, we added, we subtracted, we did everything and even and at even the end of the edit we took... Yes, the, the, there, is, there was an extra explanation that in the mm-hmm. end it was just because... Henry's father had had an affair. Mm. It was a simple domain. We talked about it very yeah, early on. Was it, what, right, yeah. what about if the end of this ghost story is just a it's tiny so domestic thing? Yeah. But it, it was actually simpler than it, you know, it was just mm. this um, this experiment. Yeah, you, be, be, I think the thing is we realised we were adding an explanation when the audience had already figured yes, out for themselves yes. it was to do with the thing and they were happy. They didn't yeah. want to go yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness, it was different. I remember having a lot of fun with this uh, Thatcher thing and trying to work it out and then of course... Um, that a man like Stapleton would, would actually put Maggie because <laughs> and it, it actually came from the fact that um, Thatcher herself always called Churchill Winston and I hate I hated it Why? It was like, she was on first name terms with him she never met him right, right, but mm. she felt like she was oh, so okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I was going to say I was going to say earlier about the chemical formula uh, I was it was it would have been so perfect it nearly was if Hound actually was hydrogen, oxygen, some if U- it was urine. Like that. that was, <laughs> yeah. and, but no chemical formula. Nettles. No, <laughs> <laughs> well, you can fill in those. <laughs> no chemical formula begins with an H, 
and it was just impo- I tried so hard. I, I spoke to uh, every chemist I could find, and it was always C something H. It just wouldn't quite work. Mm-hmm. Such a shame because that would have been extremely neat, even for a made up drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we ended up going. We, we, you, you ended up going back to uh, an idea we had ages ago, but it just been a list of names. Yeah, 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 as an acronym. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we did actually, because um, um, dodgy Photoshop is a, is a, is a bugbear of mine. Actually, it's rather good in this regard. But uh, we did actually stage a photo shoot with Clive Mantle, with the team, with a wig, wearing proper drag queen lifts to make him younger. He looked utterly he bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> so is that, that's a real photo then? That's Clive's uh, picture from the 80s, yeah. Uh, no, no, I mean, the, but that was the actual crowd. Who that's a, we, we, we staged that. Those, those are the people who right, came right. in with the sweatshirts mm. on. And, and we did originally put Clive in the back as if he was... The wig looked like um, he had sort of a cat sitting on his head. <laughs> <laughs> that was the cat of the basket. So it's a different thing. Mm. Did you get a jumper each, a sweater each? Tragically, no, I'm still angry about it. I tell you what, there was a moment here, a rare moment where the, design, the brilliant design department did a, a total... Um, uh, spinal Tap moment. Obviously, the whole point of of young Henry seeing uh, Franklin killing his father mm. and seeing that hound face, the face of the dog, and in his mind making that into the monster mm. is that it's that size on a T-shirt. And and uh, they showed me the photo of the team, and they all had these grey sweatshirts on. And I said, "Are you gonna?" They're going to put that in the post. And they went, oh, no, no, it's there. They got the T-shirt out. And the logo was <laughs> the size of a kappa. It was that big, like Adidas. I've said two brand names. They're both going to be cut out. The logo <laughs> was tiny, but nipple size. Mm. <laughs> it was like, ah. Oh, That'll be cut out. That's... Punitive measures in this show are remarkable, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark. There's two brand names. I'm going to cut out. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are you? His house. I'm okay. I'm okay. Right. Stay there. We'll get someone to you. Okay? Henry. He's a tractor. Gone. Mm-hmm. Mark, let's your girls back to For a moment, I thought that was he's a tractor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really remarkable <laughs> twist. <I remember. laughs> that was the, the, the strangest of all the intractable games. That's the, right. The <laughs> Mark, <laughs> this new draft. <laughs> I was, I was going mad. It was intractable. Yeah. It was a tractor. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work for the early scenes. <laughs> it's a tractor. <laughs> it's like uh, Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> Strange version. Have you ever seen that? Um, have you ever seen that uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, Jack Russell series? There's a series where a little dog investigates with a deer stalker hat on. It's, and it's actually, oh, some, no. of the, some of them are quite close to the originals, but with a dog. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely unbelievable. And one of them is, um, one of them is Irene Adler. No. It is. I've not actually seen that. No. a female dog. A dachshund. Yes. <laughs> Just, to show her come, she was always a bitch. <laughs> it's true. Very strange. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a long night, wasn't it, Ross? Mm-hmm. This is over two nights, wasn't yes, it? Yes, two nights. Yeah, two nights in the in the hole in the Devil's Punch Bar. Dew is hollow. Dew is a is a traditional. Oh, do you remember it rained uh, so Devon hard name. we couldn't? Oh yes. Yeah. Film. Mm. We just sat there. Strain very carefully. What? Someone needed to keep you quiet. To keep you as a child, yeah, I didn't like that hollow. That's my least favourite location. Mm. I do remember. Oh, just the death trap. Yeah, did we ever? T- I mean, we, I'm sure we did because because Dartmoor, as a location, came quite late. But we actually talked about doing it at the tour as opposed. To, it, it was all about. It was about the fog, wasn't it? Actually, of course, we needed yeah. we needed a windy, punch bowl so that the fog would collect. Yes. Although, oh, that's right. Yeah. And it was the fog, wasn't it? Because if it was exposed like that, it would never work. It would just so what, so the no, thing so is, we were at some point because I remember seeing somewhere in, in the tour and going, but it might collect here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if this person is standing in a very specific place, having a bath. <laughs> <laughs> I love the I love that gas mask. It's mm. horrifying, isn't mm. it? I think it's a Russian one. So there's pressure pads in the floor here. That's what. Yeah, that's what triggers it. it. So every time anyone goes back, the the, the fog, because it's an aerosol dispersed hallucinogenic drug, comes back. 
It's a funny thing in the original story. Doyle actually does a very naughty thing, which I felt gave me liberty to do anything, <laughs> which is that when, when Dr. Watson sees the hound, he actually says it comes tearing out of the fog with fire rolling out of its eyes and its mouth. And he actually describes it, you know, as if it's the real thing. And then it's then it's um, explained away as being luminous paint. But it's not like you are, you are allowed for a moment to believe it yeah. is actually happening. Shut up! Okay. It's okay, mate. And then this final end came out of a, a, a conversation about a sort of double whammy, wasn't it? That actually wouldn't be brilliant if, of course, ultra-rational Sherlock says there never was any dog, and then you just hear, oh! <laughs> and it's, it's all back on again. Mm. Stimulus. That's how it works. I mean, we, we also sort of sort of imagined that the audience would be watching this and thinking, oh, so there wasn't going to be a hound. And you think, that's quite clever, but it's not very exciting. Yeah, yeah. And then, oh, yes, there is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then and then he says, but it's just the ordinary <laughs> one, and then it isn't that. Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, yes, what we're yes. seeing is not. Now, tragically, if you are, what we're looking at is <laughs> really not what I hope <laughs> you're looking at. We're looking at Tom and Jerry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> Benedict is looking very, very alarmed by, frankly, some drawings. <laughs> <laughs> so the animation process with it is CGI. Have you used CGI in other episodes? There's always bits of CGI, yeah. Mm. But um, not at this level. It's no, mostly no, no. about... I mean, things like the exploded house uh, last year, you, you create sort of damage to things mm. or, mm -hmm. or um, fade things back, like mm -hmm. greenery in the summer and stuff like that. Um, this wasn't shot. He wasn't there when we were... No, wasn't there, this was, was done it? under a tent in North Gower Street yep. many months later. <laughs> this this was the third part of the double whammy, wasn't it? It's yeah. like, what if, what if he rips the mask off and it's Moriarty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the drugs have the effect yeah. on it. Actually, that what? reminds me of something. It's not for shopping. <laughs> it's not for the commentary. <laughs> <It's just> <laughs> 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 no, nothing like that. It's it's just, a little it would bit just, you know what? That sounded like it's something that's going to cost me money. No, it oh. would just be rather strangely <laughs> preserved for all time as a thought. I know, <laughs> 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 oh, it's just a mystery. It will be an internet phenomenon. Oh, what good. did Mark remember? They're all my favourites, those. The conspiracy theory. Look at it, Henry. No, no. Come on, look at it! I remember as well, poor Clive actually did the whole thing with the gas mask on because he was going to pull it off and, and then it would be revealed. But it was the wig again, wasn't it? Oh, yes. And, and it was like suffocating. It was like a gimp mask. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, you know, he, he did a lot of action, none of which we ever see. Mm. He had to discredit every word you ever said about your father. And he had the means right at his feet. A chemical minefield. Pressure pads in the ground, dosing you up every time that you came back. Yes, so this is obviously this is an equivalent of the Grimp and Meyer, which is usually where Stapleton, who's usually the buddy, mm. the little tree, um, ends up. And actually, you know, interestingly, I think talking about reading the changes, mm. the um, the Richard Roxburgh one uh, ends up with Sherlock in the Meyer, which mm. I remember thinking at the time was rather good because. Mm. Again, when you know the story so well, people know the story so well, it just it ends up sort of just mm. playing itself out. Mm. And to actually end up with your hero yeah, yeah, yeah. drowning in the quicksand is rather good. Right in the middle of an experiment. Hello. He's back. Now I feel sorry now for the dog. Because mm. once it's revealed not to be a monster dog, they just shoot and eat. I'm a dog owner. How many dogs have you got? You wrote it. Doesn't I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, there was a real tone of reproof there, I have to say, Mark. <laughs> it's my inner voice. Because <laughs> the dog, the dog, was actually, the dog was actually filmed in the studio. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah there wasn't some, a dog there, no. No, on some leaves that we gathered. I mean, you do, it's a shame because it's, it's, it was and an incredible... And it was incredible, very happy, by the way. <laughs> it was an incredible black Great Dane. Mm. Quite rare, glossy, beautiful thing. And amazingly, it was a show dog, wasn't it? It wasn't a yeah, showbiz dog. Huge, huge it would just, it just laid down. But I've often thought, you know, when you, when you see something, probably out of the basketballs, it's another version, and you see, you think, why is it, why is it facing that way? Why didn't we get a good hero close up? It's because you have a, a forty stone dog, which will only lie down in one particular way, <laughs> and that is ultimately the way you're going to shoot it. And that's exactly mm. what happened. <laughs> it was so beautiful, but. 
that's the way it was going to lie down. Mm -hmm. And so it laid sort of 45 degrees with its head away from the camera. <laughs> and that's all we could do. It is incredible, CGI, isn't it? How they're there on a day just putting like little red lights everywhere and taking photographs. And they did something very there. unusual, didn't they? And they mapped digitally the entire hollow, the whole landscape. Mm. First time I think they've done Ever that. Ever done that for television? Yeah. yeah. So normally they would just um, <coughs> a CGI dog and <coughs> walk uh, and they would attempt to adjust it to the terrain as seen in the film but here they actually didn't just make the CGI dog they made a CGI hollow so that all its movements would match the ground perfectly wow. which isn't just isn't done for television it's uh, and is it incredibly impressive it's, it's really incredibly incredible. impressive yeah, yes. although I think we should actually go back and just say it's real why would we say it's real okay, a real sure. monster yeah. start again yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well this is all a rehearsal isn't it what we're saying oh. Oh. Yeah, minute. Yeah. <laughs> can you remember all of that <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, this is interesting because uh, actually this <coughs> originally had a different ending. That's right, yes. Uh, it, originally, we were go uh, you wrote it as the we went to Jim London. Moriarty yeah. going uh, into the Tower of London to... Then we realised, because the time frame wasn't right for the start of Steve's script, which started you know, considerably back in time yeah. Um, yeah, that's right, before yeah. the thing. So. Yes, we just sat there and cobbled that up. Didn't we think that well, 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 uh, he could come out of the prison with Sherlock on the wall, didn't we? <laughs> Well, it was, and then yes, then it yeah. became a backwards throw to to yeah. scandal. Yeah. The idea that that um, that Mycroft had brought him in, mm. and that that sort of it's a, it's it's the, what happens when you make stories back to front. Yes. But sometimes it can work really well, <laughs> mm. really well, because you actually get to front load. Yeah. The the the, the story arc. Like, You're right. I have yeah. been helping immensely by by always being late with my school. <laughs> Bless you for that. Yes. God <laughs> for me. Eh? Did you say that red buttonhole was put in? Yeah. Yeah. And what is that reference, the red button? No, it's just to, I think, just to, just to oh, lift right. it. It's okay. very nice, isn't it? This is also, in fact, fans true about hallucinogenic drugs, particularly those uh, used with aerosol dispersant, that you will be perfectly all right and you will excrete it by whatever means, mm -hmm. usually sweat, yeah. within about 24 hours. So they'll, they won't be permanently affected by this made-up drug. <laughs> <laughs> by this totally made-up drug. <laughs> well, that's a comfort. <laughs> it's a bit of a gift <clears throat> that it was excreting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I ran with that one. As it were. Next time? Hmm. And oh, then, no, 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 and here this. we are. And this is uh, the wonderful Andrew Scott. Now, as we're unfortunately not able to do a commentary for the Reichenbach Fall, we must briefly talk about, quickly, how brilliant Andrew is. Yes, oh, oh stunning. Astonishing. Is he? Oh, I mean, I mean what you see in Reichenbach, it's a tour de force. It's really an extraordinary... But he is purely evil, isn't he? Yeah, but not in real life. <laughs> I don't know if he's well, actually, I don't know, maybe he is. <laughs> what do we really know about Andrew Scott? <laughs> well, I've, I know a few. <laughs> God, is that going to be filed alongside your your, your opinion that you've learned? That's the, the other thing I got. Yeah, I remember you saw him at some theatre or something, and somebody tripped over in front of him, and he just said to you, "I did that." Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he did say, "I tell you, he's um, just before we started filming, uh, right back, he sent me a picture of him outside uh, the Tower of London, no, outside um, Tower Bridge, just going." <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> without the, without the laugh, but it was implicit that he, he was laying plans for us all. <laughs> That's hilarious. He does love playing. <laughs> well, I've had a wonderful time. Thank, Thank you very you, much darling. for having Thank me. Thank you very much. Oh, Thank you for coming. <laughs>